Today, we're going to be talking about smart machining and actually manufacturing for SolidWorks. And for this special episode, I have two great guests joining me here today. I have Michael Bookley, the product manager for smart manufacturing at SolidWorks. And I have John Milbury, our resident machinist. Welcome, guys. Hey, well, glad to be here. So we're doing something a little bit different and a little bit fun today. We're going to be going through looking at kind of manufacturing a component. We're going to be talking about smart manufacturing. And for this, we're doing a few things different. John, you're joining us from, why don't we just call it Millberry uh, Machine Works? How's that sound? That works great. Thank you, so, Jim. John, tell us a little bit about the machine you have in, the, in your shop right there. Well, what you're looking at right here is a Tormach. It's a 770. It, uh, it's about a one and a half horsepower machine. It'll do 10,000 RPM. It is a great prototyping machine for aluminum. And that's why I bought it. All right. Uh, and Michael, can you tell us where are you joining us from today? Uh, it's my manufacturing bunker. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm in the office outside of, away from my machines, but uh, it's a nice secluded warm place here in snowy Colorado. <laughs> All right, and we're doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be trying to watch the chat myself today uh, instead of having questions brought to me. So if you have any questions, jump in, ask them. Richie Moore, I see you've added a couple comments out there. Really excited uh, for SolidWorks Cam. I think we're actually going to talk a little bit beyond that. Um, so I welcome everybody. If you're joining us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, I have all those chats kind of up on another screen. So you'll see me looking off over there. I see Mike Sandy joined us in the chat. Mike, great to have you here. So John, I know you've got a lot of work to do uh, in your shop. So I'm gonna let do. you do what you need to do. And I'm gonna talk to Mike here for a little bit about smart machining and manufacturing. And we're gonna come back to you in a little bit. Okay, John? Sounds great, thank you. All right, so Mike, I want to talk about, I want to go actually beyond smart machining and I want to talk about smart manufacturing and to do that, I think we need to go beyond SolidWorks CAM. So first off, for the people joining us at home who don't know, we have a, a great CAM solution in SolidWorks already. Tell us a little bit about SolidWorks CAM. Let's set the stage because what we want to talk about kind of transcends what we do even in SolidWorks CAM today, right? Yeah, exactly. So SolidWorks CAM came out with uh, SolidWorks 2018. So it's been out for a few years now, uh, really successful. It's helped a lot of companies get into, you know, starting to manufacture their own stuff, uh, understanding how CAM processes work. It, it's a great tool for two and a half axis, single turret turning, you know, some, of, some of those big um, you know, a lot of components that are built today are, are sort of that prismatic shape. So, um, as you hear John's machine running in the background, um, those types of cuts, you can tell by hearing it, that's a SolidWorks CAM type cut, the two and a half axis step over. So, uh, it, when we talk SolidWorks CAM, you know, we're talking more of those foundational prismatic components that we create. Yeah. Hey, maybe actually, John, could you maybe mute your microphone while Mike and I are chatting? We're uh, definitely hearing you cutting that aluminum in the background there. There we go. So, sounds like he's muted automatically. All right. Sounds good. Um, so really quick, looking at the chat, I'm going to be jumping back and forth to this. Uh, looks like we have... Uh, uh, where did I see this? Trial and error robotics was looking for somebody to send them a donated Tormach. I don't know. I don't, we're not doing any giveaways today, but uh, um, we're gonna, we're gonna be definitely be looking at how we're gonna leverage that machine. Um, also want to give a shout out to uh, Lumen Thoy uh, on uh, uh, over on Facebook as well, joining us there. So Sorry, Mike, I got a little distracted by the machining. So we we heard a little bit about SolidWorks CAM, but today we're gonna to be looking at machining a part that's fairly complex. It's got some 3D machining on it. So what are some of the tools that SolidWorks users have available to them to kind of take their machining and manufacturing to the next level? Yeah, so from our, our sister brand, Delmia, um, we have a, a full suite of, of CAM solutions and, and they, they start sort of at that three axis foundational step up above SolidWorks CAM. 
And they go all the way up to robotics, Swiss machining, uh, plant layout optimization, like really, really high end capability. Um, and it, it's proven technology. I mean, the, the Delmia brand has been doing cam and manufacturing since 1984. So it's, it's more of, you know, we're introducing them to our customers with the capability they've had for a long time. Well, I think what would be best here, let's take a look at some of the capabilities that Delmia can bring to SolidWorks users, or I think one of the things we're going to talk about later, anybody, you don't have to be a SolidWorks user. You don't have to be a Katia user. You can use any 3D design software and leverage these tools. But before we get there, let's take a look at some of the capabilities that Delmia offers. Let's dive in with this kind of first look, what are we doing here that's a little bit different than what we might see in SolidWorks CAM? So if we look at this first couple steps, you know, this would be traditional SolidWorks CAM, right? I'm just turning the outside part on a single spindle, but as we all know, parts become a little more complex sometimes. So with the addition of the Delmia rolls, I can now put in that live tooling and I, I can, you know, machine those gears on the lathe, which uh, reduces the number of setups and, and really makes my life easier as a programmer as well as a company to produce those parts. So, you know, if we take what we started with with SolidWorks CAM of turning that outside piece, we're now adding that live tooling and B access to it so we can actually machine those gears. I mean, that's really cool. You're both doing, you know, you're doing the machining operation on that turning spindle. One of the things that I, you know, I look at when I do this, are there ways that we can improve both our, fish, our efficiency and our precision with Delmia when we look at turn parts like this? Yeah, absolutely. The, if you look at this next one on an index machine, here we're doing pinch turning or follow turning. So we're actually removing twice the material at the same time, but we're also keeping constant pressure on both sides of the part, which creates a, a more consistent part from start to finish. So we're improving efficiency, but we're also able to keep a tighter tolerance and a better finish because as we remove the material, we're having less stress just on one side of the part. So, um, you know, when you invest in higher dollar machines like an index, you want to take full advantage of the capabilities that it comes with. So here, you know, we have two turrets and, you know, a main spindle. So I'm going to really challenge you now, Mike. I want to take what we've seen. We've seen some machining on a part turning. We've done some lathe work. I want to combine it all. Can we do, can we do stuff like that with Delmia? Yep, absolutely. Um, so if we look at this machine, we actually have sub spindle, main spindle, uh, two turrets, uh, you know, and then we have live axis. So we're doing traditional turning here. But then you're also going to see we're going to flip and we're going to do some machining on the end. We're going to do some five axis deburring and profiling. Um, so you can actually see that we're, we're finishing an entire part in one operation, but we're keeping everything consistent. Because every time we switch that part or take it out, uh, we risk the chance for human intervention, which can sometimes cause problems. So uh, if you're taking that more advanced stuff, you know, we, we can actually put it all in, simulate it, verify it. And through the virtual twin, we know exactly what it's the output's going to be when we go to the machine. So Richie Moore asks in the YouTube chat, he wants to know what we're seeing right here. He says, I want an Oscar award milled on the machine. That actually looks like some of the capability we could do with what we're doing right here. We're both turning it at the same time and doing, you know, some five axis 3D milling all at the same time, right? Yeah, we actually have a Delmia customer that scans statues and then they machine it uh, out of marble. And that's what you see like in the museums versus the original. So if you want to do an Oscar, we already have customers doing that kind of stuff with Delmia. All right, very cool. Michael, one of the things you just mentioned was the virtual twin. Can we take a look at an example of why that's important? You know, a lot of time we I get it with SolidWorks Cam, we're creating NC code, but when we look at Delmia, the word virtual twin comes up quite a bit. Let's take a look at another clip and maybe explain why the virtual twin is so important. Yeah, so with 3D experience, we have lots of virtual twins depending upon the domain we're in. For what it means for us is actually programming, simulating, validating, verifying everything that's gonna happen in that machining cycle. That also means that we're going to put machine instructions in here. So as you see here in a little bit, the sub spindle is going to come out, grab that part, index it to a position and then finish machining it. Traditionally, you would have to think about this in your head. So you'd have to have lots of machining experience to, to 
quantify that, right? Uh, inside of Dalmia, we actually write those machine instructions in, in the operation. So when we simulate it and validate it, it's exactly what's going to happen out in the real world. So let me, let me clarify that for everybody watching at home. We're actually doing more than just the, the G code for machining a part. We're actually doing all the machine instructions as well, like when different machines need to get involved. Yeah, exactly. And usually that's the big part that takes so long to set up out in the real world, right? Because I have the G code, but I have to do all this other interaction where here I can validate and simulate all that ahead of time, which shortens my time in the shop floor proving out the program. Okay. Well, well let's look at another example where we kind of, we're going to take that, we're going to take that machine code in that virtual twin and kind of bring it to another level. Show us what we're doing here, Mike. So because Delmia started, you know, with uh, companies like Boeing, Airbus, you know, Dassault Aviation, um, we, we do a lot of very high end things. And this is an example of a turbine blade. So we have special operations set up to where I can just pick the faces from the design that was done through fluid flow, you know, and the engineers did. And I can uh, do both sides of the walls plus the splitter with a few button clicks. And then we let Delmia calculate how the machine's going to move to not only calculate just the tool tip, but also the sidewall radius of that tool to make sure that the blade and the splitter are actually meeting the requirements that we need. That's pretty cool. So I, I wanna give a shout out to the chat. I, I got a question for everybody out there. If you're using uh, cam tools today, let us know uh, down in the comments below, are you a machinist or are you just a designer? So. If you're on YouTube, definitely let us know. I'm a machinist or type a one for I'm a machinist. Same thing on LinkedIn and Facebook. If you're in the chat, let us know, uh, you know, is this, cause this is some pretty cool stuff to me. I'm generally, you know, a mechanical designer, but I love seeing these parts come to life. Now, Michael, we've started talking, we've kind of, we're kind of going into this realm almost of robotics, right? We're programming more than just these components. So I want to take a look at smart manufacturing with robotics even here. So let's, let's talk about, you know, we've done subtractive uh, machining using a CNC machine. Can we start to combine all these technologies? Yeah, when you think of additive versus subtractive, it's really the same tool paths. It's just a matter of whether we're adding material or removing material. So in this example we have here, uh, we're actually using a robot as the machine to then do the additive tool paths, which are just really adding the material versus our traditional two and a half axis of removing it. So um, through Delmia, we're actually taking all the things that we do really well and we just combine it to what the customers need. All right. And then can we go further with that? Can we also leverage these robotics and this manufacturing to do parts that might not even be possible on a normal machine? Yeah. So Domia comes with 1700 robots already in the library. So you don't have to sweat about all the kinematics and axes and programming that stuff. But if you look at this example here, this part is a really long part, right? And traditionally to fit that in a machine, you'd have to have a really large machine that takes up a lot of real estate in your shop. And for a couple parts here or there, it may not be the most cost effective thing for a business. However, I could put in a large robot and then I can switch out what I present to it and then just program my parts like I normally would for a regular machine and let Delmia calculate all the kinematics and movement. So what you're gonna see here is just like we would program a normal pocket and put some holes in, when now when we hit the simulate, uh, component, we're actually letting Delmia figure out how the machine and how the robot's actually going to work. And what you'll see here in a little bit is the robot understands where its limits are. And we have the ability then to identify, hey, let's just tell the robot to move down the slide a little bit further, and then we can reach everything that we need to reach. Well, this really changes the way you look at manufacturing. Mike, I, I've never really even thought of using a robot to do the milling in this example. And I love what you just mentioned. A robot, you know, with Delmia, it kind of understands how far it can work. And then we can program the robot to even move through that process. This is pretty amazing. This is not something I've seen in the typical machine shops I've walked through. Yeah, it's, it's one of those interesting things, right? If you think of like Daniel Boyer and every kid gets a robot, like kids today are doing robotics in high school, right? 
So when we look at how manufacturing is going to change in the future, it's really going to incorporate more robotics and robots can do an, an amazing amount of tasks. It's just a matter of us thinking about new ways to use that technology that's available. Luckily for us as CAM programmers, it doesn't matter whether I have a robot or whether I have a Haas or a Fidal or any of those machines, I'm just programming everything the same and I'm letting the software determine which machine is going to move the best in that scenario. All right, I'm gonna take a look at the chat here because I see that it's like gone, it's kind of uh, blown up here a little bit. Quick on Facebook, we have Heritier Jordan. He says, I'm a CNC operator and I really want to learn SolidWorks CAD and CAM. Mike, is there any place where some, so for SolidWorks, it's really easy. Go to my SolidWorks. You can learn everything you want about uh, SolidWorks CAD there. Is there a place where people can go learn more about uh, some of these CAM tools, whether it's SolidWorks CAM or the Delmia tools? Yeah, so um, luckily for everybody, <laughs> On our SolidWorks YouTube page, we've created a manufacturing playlist to start. Uh, so there's some videos up there that walk through some things. We all, it was we have my SolidWorks. Uh, another good place is we have 3D Experience World that you can still log in for free and register and watch all of the manufacturing videos. Uh, I think we got 30 of them this year, which is pretty awesome. Um, those are the great places to start because that's the most recent current stuff we have on all of this capability. All right, and then when I go over to YouTube, I see we've got we've got a mix. We've got some mechanical designers. We've got a machinist. We have uh, Robert Garcelon is designing furniture for four axis CNC. Uh, trial and error robotics is a mechanical designer mentor who likes to make big pieces into small pieces. I like that turning big material into small material. There. Um, Let's see, and then we've got some shout outs over there. Uh, we've got other people over on Facebook interested in learning more about uh, SolidWorks as well. Again, go to mysolidworks.com or again, go to 3dexperienceworld.com and tune into some of those other sessions. I wanna keep going with this conversation here though, Mike. Uh, we were talking about robotics doing machining. Is Delmia limited in terms of machining? We are kind of talking about manufacturing now, right? Yeah, for sure. And Delmia is a, a really big uh, manufacturing division. So we cover all kinds of stuff. Uh, for example, when we're talking about painting automobiles, right? We can, we can simulate different robots, not even the same brand, all working together. And in this example, we're actually uh, validating the paint overlap and the paint spray on this car to determine whether or not the robots are programmed in the, in the correct order. Now, it is important to keep in mind, you could have Cobots, you could have ABBs, KUKAs, FANIX, all working together, and we're calculating all those movements and interference detection at, at once. It doesn't have to be all the same brand of robot. And then I, I have to imagine the other place where we'd see robotics is material handling after the machining into the manufacturing process, right? Yeah, yeah. When you're doing material handling, you know, spot welding, all of those things, you know, when you're when you're doing supply chain logistics, especially in the world of COVID, where not everybody can be together, we still have to get products out the door, right? Amazon still has to show up at your house every day with that product. So, um, with Delmia in that simulation, we can keep track and and predict workflow based on robotics. In this example, uh, an electric forklift, and we can determine our throughput and output. And you know, it really comes into leveraging that virtual twin across the entire platform. And all of this stuff could have been designed with SolidWorks to start. We're just now automating it to understand how it works. All right, so we, we've looked at some robotics. We've talked about the virtual twin. One of the things I wanna go back to, you mentioned early on in the beginning was the vast library of robotics we have available. Because the first thing that happens to me is this feels really daunting, being able to program a robot. What was the number of machines and robots we have available in a library already? So our library of robots is over 1700. Um, and then some of the machines we have are a little more specific because every company orders something a little unique. Um, but the key here is, is most companies have CAD models of those things. And then we, we can just put the, the motion and movement on it. All right, so if I wanted to do that, so say I had a unique robot, can I use Delmia to actually program it? Yep, absolutely. So what we do, and this is a good example of an ABB here, 
Um, if you think of it like SolidWorks, we're really just putting mates and degrees of freedom on it, um, but they're more intelligent, right? So here, as we're as we're working with the robot, uh, the robot on the robot, <laughs> um, we're actually be able to put in the the position and and the angles and how it works for each joint. And then Domia actually is going to solve how all those things can work together when we do the programming and positioning. So we, we put in a little bit of input up front and then we let the software do what it's great at, which is figuring out how those things can best move together. And more importantly, tell us when we try to get it to do something that it can't do. And this is how the robot in the previous example kind of understood where its range of motion was limited. Somebody went through in the library, set the robot up and it understood I can only move the arm out so far. And then that gave that user the ability to then define that it had to move down that track. Yep. Yep. Like physical dynamics, only way cooler. <laughs> All right. So we've gone down a really deep rabbit hole with advanced manufacturing here, Mike. Uh, I want to, I actually want to take a step back. I want to talk about most of our viewers are SolidWorks users. I would just want to go a step beyond SolidWorks cam. I need to do some, 3D milling. So let me show you an example of a challenge I want to task all of us here with. This is where we're going to start thinking about bringing John back into this. I have this part that I worked on here inside of SolidWorks. It's part of a mold for a remote control. And I've done this using interchangeable inserts. And I want to just look at creating kind of this core plate that is one cover that we're going to have on there. So this is something that might present a challenge to me inside of SolidWorks CAM, what would be my neck, where would I go inside of these Delmia tools to do this? Sure, so if we remove all the robotics and the high-end stuff, uh, the first place to start, which is the best, is our shop floor programmer uh, role that came out. Um, that that's sort of that, you know, just above what we're doing with SolidWorks cam today and it, it introduces you to the world of, you know, being able to do whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, so let me ask you another question. So this question comes up a lot. Um, so these Delmia tools, these are on the 3d experience platform, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So do I have to have a connected tool? So by that, I mean, Solid, you know, we have SolidWorks connected. We have SolidWorks with the 3D experience connector. You have Katia tools. Am I stuck in that ecosystem? No, that's one of the advantages of manufacturing is we're sort of cat agnostic in what we do. Uh, we consume the data that comes from any parametric modeling. Assume they model it well, right? Um, <laughs> you know, but if you look at the platform, we have we have connectors for SolidWorks, we have connectors for Katia, we have connectors for, you know, a lot of the common ones, you know, Inventor, NX, those things. So if a company is using all these different CAD systems, uh, which we can argue which one's best later on, but if, right. if we're putting that data in the platform, then we consume that and we can machine on anything. Um, so it really opens up the world of, we don't care what CAD system you use. Um, obviously SolidWorks is the best if anyone asks, but you know, we, we can use anything. So I use SolidWorks here. Um, so regardless, I get my file into shop floor programmer, right? That's the, what we're going to use we're, we basically just want to do some three, uh, three D machining. I've done some basic setup. Let's walk through, what somebody might uh, in, encounter when they have to go through this. So what's one of the first steps after like going through the setup of, of getting your stock material set up? What's one of the first things a user would do to machine this part? So the first thing that I would normally do is look at roughing it out, right? Um, so we have some automated roughing routines. You know, we, we pick our tool and then we just say, hey, here's our stock, here's our finished part. And we go through and let it rough. And it, it is important to understand too that with Delmia, we're doing true surface machining, uh, not mesh model machining. So the surfaces that you created in whatever CAD system, we're going to machine that true surface. Um, we're not going to look about the deviation in that. So we'll pick our pick our stock, pick our part. We put in the stuff we have, you know, depending upon the horsepower of the machine and and how cool we can make a video, um, we'll determine how fast we want to run this. <laughs> So it looks like you get to a certain step. So you've gone through, you've defined that roughing step, you hit calculate and it, it right away, it just starts showing me a preview of what that machining operation is going to look like. Yep. Yeah, that's one of the benefits when I compute toolpath, um, 
you know, it, it's a full fledged cam system. There's hundreds of ways to look at how it runs, but the most basic way that we've all grown up and accustomed to is we want to see the material be removed and see what the result is. Okay. And if I look at this screenshot down in the lower left hand corner, it's not running right now, but it was spitting out a bunch of numbers. Can you explain we're actually, are we like actually generating the G code right on the fly? So we have the ability to generate G code on the fly. What we're looking at in the lower left hand corner, because the machine is also tied to this, like the actual virtual twin machine, we're actually looking at the cutter location. So we know feeds and speeds. We know uh, location of where it's going to be. We know when it goes to rapid, we know when it goes to feed rate. So if you're old school programmer or you, you started in the shop, like John and I did, um, those things are important to us. We want to know as we lead into this, like what's our feed rate going to be. So we get that real time feedback as we simulate. It's not just a pretty picture on the screen. All right. So I want, we want to clean this up now. This was a pretty general roughing. It looked like we had about a one millimeter offset on the part. We want to start to refine this a little bit. You think we do another roughing operation with a smaller mill here? For myself, that's generally what I would do. Uh, I would do a rough and then, you know, just rough out the rest machining or rest material. So I, that means I need to pick a new tool, right? Yep. All right. So looks like here we're just going to go grab a new tooling assembly. Looks looks like we have a whole library of parts there. One of the things that's really cool there is I see it automatically did a tool change right there. Yeah. So when we were talking earlier about the machine instructions, if you look at the, the tree on the left, the activities process tree, we're actually building that history. And for, you know, parametric modeling people, you know, the feature manager tree is, is that history of everything that I've done. We actually, uh, take that to heart in Delmia and we follow those exact same steps. So when there's a tool change, we know exactly where that tool change is going to be. Okay. One of the other things we did here is different than last time. In the last roughing step, we hit compute and then we played a simulation of the part being machined. This time I noticed uh, we and we kind of already went past it. We clicked this little yellow pyramid icon in the dialog box. And instead of running a whole simulation, it looks like graphically it just showed us what's going to happen to the part. Can you explain what's different about the way we're viewing it this time? Yes, yeah, so we, we have an option we can turn on called intermediate stock. And when we have that turned on, uh, it activates our rust machining capability. So as much fun as it is to to impress the boss with the tool moving around the screen to prove that I'm doing something. Uh, the reality is, is sometimes we need to be a little more efficient. So by using the intermediate stock button, what I'm actually seeing is the toolpath get calculated and it just shows me the result of what material has been removed without waiting for the toolpath to actually run through its process. Well, that's really cool. I mean, because, you know, somebody like me, I use a tool like SolidWorks. I'm very visual. So like understanding it this way, definitely makes it a lot easier for me to understand what's going on uh, right here with this. So I definitely appreciate that you click that button and it just automatically calculate it, changes it visually. All right. So I think the next thing we need to do is we need to do uh, some fine machining to this. We're going to fast forward a little bit and get to kind of one of the last steps here. We're going to do some more advanced surface machining here, I think. And this time we're going to take the offset off. We're going to do sweeping. Mike, tell me here really quick. A lot of people, they're used to seeing that traditional style tool path. That's kind of what we're seeing here. Yep. So as I mentioned before, we have all kinds of settings we can turn on and off. And, and for a lot of the, the old school programmers, we all learn that we look at the tool path and see it on the screen. So through a quick toggle, I can have intermediate stock. I can have my tool path turned on and I can see the simulation all at once. Um, it really is just how you want to program is how we can make a display for you, uh, which is sort of nice because there are times I want to look at the tool path too. If it's a really complex five axis part, I want to see where the color code changes from rapid to feed to lead in because we can control all those different feed rates. That's great. There's a question in chat that I think is perfect for this. It comes from uh, Richie Moore again. He basically asked, and I think this goes back to what we were looking at before, but also what John's going to talk about. It says, so this allows to check to uh, the tool to hit virtually and save the machine from real damage. And, and that's kind of what, when we talk about the virtual twin, that's one of the things we're doing here, right, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. We're When you load in the actual machine, we're doing uh, kinematic validation and verification of 
Uh, can the machine move to that position? Are we out of limits? Are we trying to twist, uh, you know, the, some of the multi-axis stuff in a position that can't be used? So it's one thing to program the part. It's another thing to make sure we don't damage that $2 million machine <laughs> because the machines move a lot faster than the human can hit the e-stop. Our, our friends at FANUC uh, told us last year, they call that the crash confirmation button when you hit the e-stop because it's already too late. So we want to make sure that the crash confirmation button isn't needed. All right. I have another question for you. I think this is a good question. We covered it a little bit. This one comes from Facebook from Tegan Rossi. Says shop floor is a 3D experience module on yearly subscription with a question mark. Is it a standalone that can go with my SolidWorks professional? Basically, the, I think they're asking is, do I already have to have this 3D experience stuff or can I just use this tool with SOLIDWORKS or I think we kind of mentioned it virtually any CAD. Yeah, so I know in some of uh, some of the ways we've we've talked about the platform previously uh, is I have to put all my CAD data in the cloud and it's good for PDM and PLM and all those things. But us on the manufacturing side, we're a little odd. So for us, if engineering's using SOLIDWORKS and they're using a process that works for them, that's great. I can. I can use the 3D Experience platform just for the Domia solutions. I could use the X apps or SolidWorks or those, but I don't have to move everything to the platform. If my manufacturing team wants to be more efficient, I can use 3D Lean for meetings and I can use Domia and just put my data in the platform and, and sort of replace that network folder that most manufacturing guys work in. Um, we're just augmenting the design process with downstream stuff for Domia. So, it is a yearly subscription. There is a purchase option, so you can purchase and do support, like you know some people may have done with SolidWorks in the past. But you don't have to put your entire engineering data in the platform to be able to use Domia. So, uh, Michael, I've just been informed. I've been missing all of the chat on LinkedIn. I have it up now, so I'm <laughs> going to quick go through. I'm going to scan through some of these questions. Looks like we had a lot of people responding to our question about whether they were on CAM or, or whether they were a mechanical engineer or a machinist. Had a lot of machinists. Uh, Marcus Madrid, he's 3D machining, uh, or he says 3D machining should be uh, uh, a great uh, or a standard option. Um, how about, this is a great question from Dennis Alicia on LinkedIn. He says, how about material preparation? John Milbury is actually going to talk about getting the material prepped in, in the machine in just a little bit when we jump over to him. So I think that's a great question, Dennis. We're going to take a look at that in a few minutes. Um, all right. I think we're caught up on the questions over there. One other question. If you refer to shop... Oh, so uh, solidworks.dkaps on YouTube asks, uh, when you refer to shop floor, is it a so product, not the cam work shop floor? We talk about shop floor. We're actually talking about a, an experience that we bring to the users at 3D Experience World every year. But we also refer to the shop floor as kind of the environment that folks like Mike and John are working in. Do you think that's how the question should be answered, Michael, or, do you, or am um, I missing that question? So CamWorks has a product called CamWorks Shop Floor. Okay. And what it does is it takes all your stuff, puts it in a container and allows you to view it. To be 100% transparent, the 3D Experience platform with Delmia does the exact same thing. Uh, so when we're talking Shop Floor Programmer, we're talking about our cam role that we see right here. But that also contains everything that you would normally see in like cam workshop floor, your, your G code files, your container, your ability to view things with 3D play, all that stuff is there. So with the platform to collaborate in manufacturing, if I have the 3D experience platform for them, excluding engineering right now, I can have people view stuff, download stuff, capture things. Um, the shop floor programmer role is actually can be a viewer for anybody that has five axis. So if I program a part in five axis, I can open up the shop floor programmer and view those tool paths in the same way. So it's Camworks has their product um, that does similar things to what the 3D experience platform does inherently through communication and collaboration. Okay. And then I'm going to ask you one last question because I want to see parts getting cut here. I'm really excited. We've done this. Uh, we've done this part of it. One more question for you, Michael. 
Uh, Dennis Alicia on LinkedIn asked, and, and are you plotting the NC only or the NCI? I've never heard the term NCI. So when, when we plot out, and I'm assuming he's referring to NCI as like CL data. <clears throat> um, so when we post out our G code, we can post out the ISO format G code, we can post out the app format, and we can also post out um, CL data or cutter location data. Um, you know, keep in mind that Domi has been around since 84, right? So we still post to things that are in Fortran <laughs> for some of our company customers that have old machines. So it, we're really universal in that, in that standpoint. So we can really display or, or convey that information out to in any sort of any format that you could read in. It just depends upon which one works best for you. In today's world, we're more ISO based. Uh, you know, true G code type thing, but all of that stuff when we post is in a container uh, that you can download, share, zip, that kind of stuff. All right. Well, I want to go back to John. John, are you there in your uh, at Millberry Machine Works? Yes, I am. All right. So, uh, sorry, we we I've been anxiously awaiting this part. We've we've gone through. Michael had some great information on like how we're going to set up, uh, you know, using Shop Floor Programmer. How we'll set up this code. I'm ready to see a part get made. But before we do this, one of the questions in chat is, how do we prep the materials and get the machine ready? That's probably the first thing you have to do, right? Well, it is. Um, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> one of the very first things I need to do is is how am I going to machine this? How am I going to grip it? And how I'm going to hold it? Now, in this particular example, I already had a five inch vise set up instead of a tooling plate. So I went ahead and I used the vise. The vise contains some Talon grips. The Talon grips, there's four of them you can see that will actually bite into about 70 thousandths of the stock on the very bottom of the part. And I know just the right amount to torque that down to hold it. And all of that seems like it's not much to hold it. It really is. We can do really deep cuts. And you can see I'm doing a very deep cut right now. And so it, uh, it's a very flexible, very easy to use system. Okay. so. Once you've defined this, the virtual twin kind of of this vice, you know, we've been talking virtual twin a lot. Um, I imagine you have to set this up in the machine and define where it's going to go inside of your Tormach that you're running behind you. Yeah, one of the things we want to do is we want to make sure that there's a machining envelope involved in all machines. And so a virtual twin is going to know what that machining envelope is. It's very easy to place a vise and your part when you're doing a setup and get part of the part outside of the machining envelope. Now, if you were to do that on the 3D Experience platform, there's actually a dynamic reachability test and it'll tell you that you can't reach it. I like to be very precise. So what I do is, is I visually place it first, as you can see in this picture, and then what I do is, is if you go to the next slide, you'll see that there's actually, I take a bearing or a dimension from the bottom right corner of the machine bed to the bottom right corner of the vise. And what I tell the machinist is, is this is where to locate the vise so that you're right in the sweet spot of the machining zone and okay. you won't drift outside of it. So you go through this whole process, you've defined where the part kind of exists inside of the machine, inside of this tool. Now you've got, now what happens? You put the real material in, you measure it out. How do you make, you know, you've, you've measured the location of the vice and the material. What, how do you, how do you tell the machine that, yep, it's in the right spot that it needs that where it needs to be? Oh, that's a great question. So typically we can do that a number of different ways, but we, a lot of people like to to set what we call the G54. And this is okay. what I'm doing here with this probe. So what I'm actually doing is, is I'm setting a new work coordinate system that is much easier to understand 
than the machine's coordinate system. So here you can see we're going to the lower left corner. We did X and Y, and now we're touching off in Z. And effectively what that does is, is it sets a work coordinate system called G54. And that then becomes my X, Y, Z, zero. Now the key is communication. And the programmer needs to convey to the machine, as such as myself, exactly where on that raw material that that X, Y, Z is located. Okay. So, and then that comes from basically what me and Michael did. That comes from uh, the shop floor programmer. We basically, that data, that you're bringing that right over and you're capturing that information there? Yes. In fact, um, <clears throat> typically Michael put put a note on there that goes, it says something like, um, set X, Y, zero at near left corner of block, set Z, zero at top of block. And that tells me where to set the XYZ zero for G54. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you set this all up. Um, we've, we've seen that basically we can create the NC code or the G code inside of shop floor programmer. Mm -hmm. What do you do to, to bring that into your Tormach machine over there? I, first thing I have to, I should have asked Michael this. How did he know, like, how did he set up the G code specifically for your machine? Or how did you, how does, how does that process of going from defining how the part's going to be machined over to your specific Tormach? Well, Michael actually did that. Uh, Michael, okay. Michael actually, what he did was he ran it through a post-processor. And the post-processor takes the cutter location data that's generated in Domia and C. And what it does is it converts it to G code specifically for this machine tool here. So it, 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 <clears throat> it's custom tailored specifically for your environment then at that point. Yes, it is. All yes, right. it is. And you can see here the resulting tool paths. Here's what we're machining live right now. Oh, very cool. So this is that actual part we were just looking at. You're cutting this, what, out of a piece of aluminum right now? Yeah, 6061 T6. Okay. And what, what you're actually doing is you're seeing the real-time machining with the door closed. And so this allows me to get a very good understanding from a safety perspective exactly what I'm encountering there on the machine. I love that you added from a safety perspective. I, John, I couldn't help but notice on your back wall, it says 1,203 days without an incident. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that was, that was uh, one day short of when I had an extra finger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask what happened 1,204 days ago. Well, <clears throat> that's when Johnny Fourfinger was created. <laughs> that's a that, that that's a fun piece of commentary for everybody who uh participated in the live chat at 3d experience world i think johnny fourfinger right. came up quite a bit right 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 always well, be safe well john that's awesome that you're showing us the actual part being machine uh, Mike, I want to bring Michael and John both back on camera if that's possible. So we kind of did this collaborative process. Michael kind of helped me with uh, shop floor programmer. What you're first of all, what I should have said, what you're seeing, uh, John cut. That's that half inch roughing path that basically we we worked on, right, Michael? Yep, for sure. That's the exact same thing that we were showing earlier. And so, John, can you validate that uh, using Shop Floor Programmer, Michael was able to uh, put together a, a pretty solid uh, G code for you to cut the actual part with? Yeah, I didn't have to call him up one time. Our, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> our programming techniques are um, are pretty similar. Plus, Michael also owns Tormach machines, so he understands the power ratio and how hard to push them, and the depths of cut. So I got to ask a question, John, you were, you were talking to me, uh, I think it was last week, you had mentioned Tormach is kind of this affordable 
I'll use the word affordable CNC machine for somebody like you. You had said that they're coming out with an affordable uh, five axis machine. Was that correct? Uh, no, no, they're coming out with a uh, well five axis machine. It's a robot. They're actually oh, okay. getting into robots okay, and it's great. going to be, <clears throat> it's going to be a value proposition similar to their machine tools, which is very similar to SolidWorks in general and our platform products. It's just a lot of power, a really good price. And I'm looking forward uh, to playing around with some of their robots here in the near future. So, Michael, is that going to pose a problem? We just did all this work. We we basically built all that code using three axis machining with shop floor programmer. When John unlocks this new capability, we saw some of the robotic stuff earlier, but he's going to want to leverage some five axis milling at that point. What what's that process look like? Does he have do we have to start all over? <laughs> no, no. So we'll just turn on the five axis roll. Uh, load in some of the capabilities and then, you know, through our three to five axis converter, we'll check a box and add the parameters for how that machine can run and <clears throat> we'll be, we'll be good to go. We didn't lose any of the time or effort we've already put in. So Michael's talking about a technology that's near and dear to my heart. If we've got a three axis tool path and we're machining it on a three axis machine, it's as simple as just hitting a check box that says convert to three axis to full five axis. And, and that's it. And that's it. And you can limit the amount of tilt. And what's really cool about that is we can do that because we're machining on true surfaces rather than a tessellated triangle set. So it's so incredible we really capability. So if we really wanted to get advanced with our remote control, the reality is we'd have some core poles and some slides in there for some snaps. Those are gonna be at some crazy angles coming into that surface. That's when we could leverage John's new five axis tour, his new robotic tour Mac, and we could turn on five axis and we could just cut those pockets for those slides out, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, this, it sounds like if John gets this piece of equipment, we're going to have to do another SolidWorks Live and take this to a, a, another level at that point. If John gets that equipment, I'm going to move into his basement. <laughs> <laughs> All I right, guys. If I, if I get that my equipment, I think my wife's moving out. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back and take a look at some of the chat here. It's been kind of going on. Uh, I see, uh, I see on YouTube, uh, awesome, I love it, that's great. Is there an overview of which function is available and which role? Uh, thanks to our production staff, they gave them a link right there. We're on uh, the 3D, uh, solidworks.com slash 3D experience works where they can go find that. Um, let's see, I'm gonna jump over here to LinkedIn. Um, there, here's a question for you, Michael. I'm going to ask it to you. Uh, why are we restricted to climb in area clearance operation? I, I guess I don't maybe don't understand this question. For SolidWorks CAM, I'm assuming. Okay, yeah, it's probably uh, a SolidWorks CAM question. Yeah. Yeah, we'd probably have to look at the specific instance of the geometry they have because uh, there is climb and conventional, but it sort of depends upon the geometry and the tool path that's created. Um, but traditionally, with CNC machines, you're gonna climb cut versus conventional. Conventional is more of what was used in manual. I know there's a variance if you're doing zigzag and things like that, but if you're doing zigzag cutting, then you're gonna vary the feed rate between climb and conventional anyway, because it requires different horsepower and chip load. So please send that question to support and we can take a look at that specific part. Um, it, there's a whole science behind this and it, depending upon the geometry they have, it may be limited to try to protect the NSF. All right, so uh, Farad, uh, Ardian, if you want to reach out to your SolidWorks reseller and send them that part, like what Mike just, I have no idea what Mike just said there. Again, I'm a CAD guy. He taught, he just threw out all the words that uh, my, I just got a little bit lost there. Um, another question here, um, Michael uh, from Kenyon Sprow on uh, Facebook says, can G codes be collected from an actual part that's scanned by a pinpoint besides using 3D imaging from program constructions? I guess I don't understand that. I, I don't understand a lot of these questions being the CAD guy. We're getting very technical here. 
So what I can say is with Dalmia, we can take scan data and machine directly on the scan data. Okay. Um, that's there. Obviously there has to be, it has to be good geometry, right? Um, but one of the differences between our solvers cam product and the Delmia product is the difference between tessellated machining versus surface machining. So with the true surface machining capability, we have the ability to machine with scan data. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that customer that does statues, they scan the model and then machine a replica. Um, with solid or scan, because we're using the tessellated component, then you have to do more work to prep the model to be SolidWorks surface certified, sort of. And then we can do machining from a SolidWorks surface. But um, it really sort of depends upon the process that they have, that, that they're All doing right. now. John, I got to ask, did you pause the machine or are you still cutting metal over there? Uh, I went ahead and paused it during okay. the Q&A, so <laughs> you wouldn't have to put up with that. <laughs> I wanted to take another peek at that image of that uh, part running. Uh, can we, uh, can you, I'm going to do some last minute announcements. If you want to go ahead, fire that back up. Wait a minute. I got a great question. I'm going to, John, I'm going to ask this to you. This just showed up on YouTube from, uh, I am going to pronounce this wrong, Femex Sack. It says, what part of your job do you like the most, John? Ah, well, I tell you what, um, I love probably the entire programming and manufacturing portion of my job. Um, I do do, I do design now, but I, it's mostly when I'm doing fixture design and process planning, but I love the actual manufacturing. If you think about it, I'm being paid by Dassault right now to do what I love and that's to machine and really to bring engineers dreams to life, right? Cause it's all theory till we, we create it and we assemble it and we test it. So I love you know, that. Yeah. You know, I love uh, imagining and creating and kind of this virtual world, but you're actually taking that imagination and that virtual model and turning it into the real thing. I think that's really cool. Michael, got to ask you the same question. What part of your job do you love the most? So a fair amount of it's going to overlap with John. Uh, I think the other thing that, that John and I both love is interacting with people, seeing the new technology, working with students like seeing someone's eyes yeah. light up when you actually get them to build something with their hands is, is really, really cool. Yeah. All right. I'm going to do, so I'm going to start wrapping up our show here. I'm going to, I got two announcement slides. I kind of want to go through, uh, John, if you want to go ahead and fire that machine back up, cause when I finish, I think we're going to cut over to you machining that part as we get ready to close out the show. So John, feel free. We're going to, we're going to start looking at wrapping up. If you want to hit go again on that machine, I'm going to, um, I'm going to just do a couple of quick announcements here. First, I want to thank both Michael and John for joining me here today. This was really cool. We've been virtual for the last year. We wanted to find a way to leverage this virtual environment. And with John having his own Tormac machine at his, uh, at his home office, this is something that, you know, back when we did this in the studio would have probably been hard to do. So this was a really cool opportunity. I love getting to see new technology that's new to me in a lot of different ways. So, but what's next for you, the viewers? Um, let's go ahead and on March 25th, if, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, I highly encourage you to do so. We're going to be uh, doing a SolidWorks live design next Thursday, March 25th. Again, this is 11 a.m. Eastern time. Mark Peterson's gonna be joining me and he's going to be showing me how he uses SolidWorks to improve his home office. I think he's going to be covering some design for additive manufacturing, which could be really, really cool. And then a month from now or four weeks from now on April 15th, we're gonna be coming back with SolidWorks Live. We're planning our schedule for the next year. We're very open. So if you have any ideas, post those in the comments below. We'd love to see some of your ideas. Last year, we did a lot of customer testimonials and interviews, things like that. Uh, we could look at other products like manufacturing, simulation, stuff like that. So if you have something you'd want to see, definitely put it in the comments down below. <clears throat> As always, I want to thank everybody for joining us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Sorry, I couldn't figure out the Instagram chat today to, to reply instantly. But 
With that, I'm going to say goodbye. We're going to cut to John for a few seconds before they cut the stream. John, you want to throw that iPad up at, uh, at the camera so we can see that part getting cut? Looks like he's going to pull that up. We'll watch this for, I don't know, 30 seconds, and then the, the stream will cut off. So let's see that part getting machined, and I want to thank everybody for joining us.